Hi, this is Lim McMahon. We're here at NUJ Talk on New Social Media. We're joined by Susan Grossman, uh, who's a lecturer and journalist for the last 30 years. Uh, hi, Susan, thanks for joining us. Um, you've been here for 30 years. Can you sort of briefly outline the significant changes in gym and how it's affected your job? Has it made it easier or more difficult? It's made it so much easier. I mean, when I started as a journalist, I had a typewriter. We cut and paste meant a pair of scissors and a bit of sellotape. Uh, we had tipex to rub out the mistakes, and if we made too many mistakes, we had to start again. Um, so I've been through the entire process of, of getting a computer, learning about email, learning about the internet, uh, mobile phones. Everything has changed completely. And when I teach now and I lecture uh, on the MA in journalism at Westminster University, I get students all the time who say, what did you do before Google? And it's a genuine question. What's the answer? Well, the answer is, you use your head. Um, journalists, young journalists, come into the profession, have never, ever experienced research. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to really write more than 140 characters anyway. So when I give them a, um, a project of 1,200 words, they, 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 they think, well, how can I sustain 1,200 words? What am I going to write? Um, it's a very different way of thinking. But when I teach investigative journalism, for example, um, they think they know nothing about it. And all you have to really do is sort of say, well, you know, you have investigated things. You bought your bike. You got into this course. What did you do to find out? Yeah, yeah people think uh, investigative journalism is something really large, but is it more a reflection of a lot of the disposable journalism? It seems to come along with any serious bit of well, I think all journalism should be and is investigative journalism, and there are a lot of reports, particularly in the Sunday papers, where if you read between the lines, it's one person going into a shop and buying 16 bottles of whatever it is, um, and that's an investigative report. Uh, or, in terms of case studies, it might be um, a mother and a daughter who've gone to a, an agency for modelling and decided that they got ripped off in whatever the small print was and then looking into the details of what all the agencies are modelling do. People can do it. It's not a difficult thing to Basically, do. Basically, it's because making some efforts, and that's considered best of journalism. It's, <laughs> it's making an effort, but I would have thought that anybody who calls themselves a journalist or wants to be a journalist, that's the minimum they can do. But when I teach journalism, the one thing that I think is important is that um, people read everything, um, whether it's online or, or in print, and that they ask questions and they react because the most important part of will you get published is because uh, is to think about is the st is the story topical. So stories are made up of things that journalists react to, and. If it's generic, it's just spring, or it's just whatever it is, nobody's going to publish it. But it has to start, when I teach pitching, for example, it has to start with something like, on the back of the news this week, that so-and-so did this. Would you like a story about it? What would you say, though, uh, if you're investigating something, and you say it's important for it to be topical, work an FOI in, the Freedom of Information request, you're looking up every 20 days before we get that information back. You may have missed the boats in terms of it being topical. I mean, what, what would you suggest to your students about that? Well, the freedom of information, as you say, is a sort of bigger picture. So if you're working on your own as a journalist and you're quite young, you're probably not going to come up with that in the first few stories or for the first few years. Once you get to that stage, you've probably got a newspaper behind you, you've probably got colleagues behind you, you've probably got support. So I'm saying that as a, as a journalist who's just coming into the profession, um, there are so many things you can do if you just think of your own interests, your own passions, your own questions, your own curiosity, because you represent everyone else like you, and that's the thing to think of. It's not you anymore, it's 200,000 other readers who are like you, your interests. Uh, and you say the technology has really helped um, to make it easier in many ways and kind of democratise journalism to quite a reasonable degree. But at the same time, maybe it's made it more difficult for people to get paid jobs doing that. Would you say that's true and is there ways around that? I think a lot of young journalists will say, oh, I've had to do this for nothing, oh, they haven't paid me, uh, you know, when should I stop not being paid and when should I start sort of saying no? My answer to that is never saying no. 
never say no. I had a friend, he's about 78 now, he lives on a houseboat, and he said no, they're not paying me enough, and he never earned any money as a journalist because it never was enough. And I say, do everything, use every opportunity as a networking one, and when you've done one thing, you've got it to show the next person who's going to pay. And you've been able to network with those people. Everything leads to something else. If you stay at home and you don't get out of bed, nothing happens. Just get yourself out there, meet people, and you build up CV at the same time. Yeah, and I think it's important that people share. So that's why I run workshops for journalists. And I get quite a lot of older journalists who've been, say, editors for 20 years and have suddenly been made redundant. And they're on the opposite side of the fence suddenly because they've never been a freelance before. Uh, they know the skills of being a journalist, but they've never sold things. And they suddenly think that it's them they're selling. But it's not. What you're selling is ideas. So I get quite a lot of people of all ages, up to 80, um, having brilliant ideas and saying, well, how do I convey those ideas and interest an editor? And it's match, it's match, it's formula, um, and it's really quite straightforward. And on the note, you said you did um, pitching workshops for freelancers. Uh, a cafe, is it? So can you tell us a bit about that? Where, where is that? How much does it cost and how often are we? Okay, um, I run freelance cafes, which are often six weeks in a row, uh, where you can join other journalists, quite small groups, probably six, eight or ten, um, and you can share ideas, you can find, they can suggest to you, oh, I pitched to X last week and he might be a good one for the, your story on whatever it is, and I help them focus on ideas, develop ideas, and understand what editors want. So those are the freelance cafes. I hold them at the Poetry <coughs> Cafe in Covent Garden. Um, and I also run pitching to editors workshops, which are sort of slightly more sophisticated. Okay. And I hold those at the Royal Institute of British Architects. The next one is on the 28th of April. And that's again a group of people who are being introduced to publications they would never have thought of writing for. Um, and they're being introduced to people who can help them develop their stories, ideas about outlets that they've really thought about, um, and all sorts of things like websites and sources that uh, will help them. And then afterwards, of course, they've got a group of 12 people who they continue to network with and um, become much more supportive. Um, supported, if you like, because there's nothing more lonely than sitting at home as a freelance with your computer in the fridge, um, and that's all you've yeah, got. Right. And, and do we need to sign up to this in advance, or they can yeah. just come along? Or? They're, they're all on my website, which is susangrossman.co.uk, um, and if there aren't uh, specific workshops, I work one-to-one -one with a lot of people anyway. Just one session can sort of get you Sorry. off into the right direction. And how much would someone pay for the weekly or the occasional uh, cafe where there's a group of people? Um, the group of people where there's six weeks, it's only £160 for a total six weeks, which is really nothing when you think. And if you look on my LinkedIn site, there's a lot of people who've said you know, they pay for themselves within sort of days, really. And my one to one uh, w uh, work with an individual is £70. Pounds. Um, and my pitching to editors is £125 for the day. And I really don't think there's anyone that doesn't find that good value. I've had people coming from Brussels, people coming from tips of Scotland or Paris. Um, I facilitate. If somebody is a journalist and they want to do it, they can do it. I just help them find the way of feeling motivated, having the confidence to approach editors. And if I believe in them, generally they go off and believe in themselves. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for joining us. This is Glenn McMahon um, yeah, discussing with Susan about the sort of difficulties and the options to getting your work out there given there is less paid work and there's more and more options for people to work for themselves with all the social media available to them. This is Glenn McMahon uh, for Vision on TV here at Smithfield's Market.